Hi, I'm Lisa Walkish, Grant Thornton's National Managing Principal of Industry. I'm joined today by our Chief Economist, Diane Swank, and the head of our transportation industry, Randolph Smith. Diane and Randolph are with us today to talk about what's happening in the transportation sector as we emerge from the pandemic. They'll discuss workforce issues, supply gaps, infrastructure needs, and what happens next in a remote world. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Randolph and Diane. Thank you for joining us. And so we're seeing this weird dichotomy of pockets of labor market tightness amidst millions of people still unemployed. And that's a really unusual kind of situation. The trucking industry in particular already had problems prior to the pandemic because there were limits on who you could hire. Um, one, many people didn't want to be on the road for all that length of time. Many um, families that are had big extended families would rather not be away from home for that long. But also we found problems in crossing states. And as many employers, when the unemployment rate was going down to three and a half percent and below that prior to the pandemic, we saw many employers trying to look into things like former felons and people who had been incarcerated to try to bring them back into the labor force, give them a second chance. But of course the trucking industry in particular had a problem with that about who could travel across state lines and, and be drivers. So the overall environment in terms of the labor market situation, even though millions are still unemployed, there's a lot of hurdles, particularly for transportation, where they're seeing pockets of literally an inability to find drivers, sometimes at any price. And I think that's one of the big challenges out there. Driver recruiting has been an issue. The driver shortage has been an issue for decades and decades. And I'm not sure it's a sol solvable problem and it has been exacerbated during this situation. You know, in addition to the, the, the pockets of labor shortages you've talked about, uh, as, you, as you know, the American Trucking Association and other uh, modes of transportation went to hair follicle testing effective January 1st of 2020. And many drivers uh, were, uh, were, were essentially fired because they could not pass those tests. And those drivers are not coming back into the labor pool at all. We've not seen that, uh, and then of course that was exacerbated also by the pandemic. So again, I'm not I'm not sure we'll ever solve the driver problem. Uh, carriers have tried to solve it with compensation. That's been helpful some. They tried to solve it with uh, drivers under 21 who served in the military. That's not uh, been as much of a help as we thought it might be. So once again, I just, I'm not sure we're going to solve this issue anytime soon. Sadly, I tend to agree with you on that. It's, it is a pocket where there has been t labor market tightness. The only thing I can say out there is it is also an opportunity cost, right? For people who can't get drivers, because right now we do have these bottlenecks. We do have higher charges on freight. And at some point in time, we're seeing, you know, right now we're starting to unleash that pent up demand in services, which doesn't mean the driver shortage will go away or the demand will go away, but some of the high rates that many of the carriers are seeing will begin to dissipate a bit. These are bottlenecks that will play out over time. And that's something that, you know, not having a person in place means you've lost that opportunity as well. As you're aware, there's been a, a terrific shortage in both containers used in maritime and ocean shipping, as well as intermodal in the continental U.S., and trailers. And uh, we don't see those shortages being solved anytime soon. Uh, they're acute. We've got carriers of all sizes and types who are searching desperately for trailers. The manufacturers are not keeping up, can't keep up. And the age of that trailer fleet is, uh, is, is quite cumbersome. So, um, you know, we don't see a, 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 a correction there for quite some time. Uh, it's impacting uh, the, the transfer of goods for sure. And uh, once again, I'm not, I'm not sure how we'll, uh, or when we'll solve that problem. Probably, it looks to me, based on my discussions with different carriers, that we're probably talking late 21 to mid 22 before we're able to address that uh, favorably. 
Well, and that really underscores, you know, the issues that we've seen in the global supply chain as well. As you know, we've seen container shortages around the world, and many of the containers that are used for shipping, of course, are produced in China. And we found that it's just much easier to turn off the lights on a plant than ramp them back up again, especially in a world where we're managing co the COVID virus still, not necessarily eradicating it as we had hoped. That has also changed the dynamics and put even more pressure on supply shortages and not being able to ramp up production fast enough. I think the other issue is that we're going to have to be looking at going forward is what kind of investments can um, trucking and transportation industry more broadly make in terms of digitizing, in terms of increasing productivity growth of existing, what they have in existing fleets and existing containers. And that's really tough to do when you've got perhaps at one point in time a, a, a container abroad that you're waiting that's stranded in another country empty right now and trying to get it back. Back. But as we get this stuff moving again, we are talking about a pivoting of production, you know, a pivoting of demand away from goods back into services, but it's not as if the goods side of it's going to disappear. And so what really I think the focus is going to be on going forward is that last mile, getting um, the goods to the consumer in the last mile of transportation. And that's going to be really interesting. I've seen some major retailers and some larger um, uh, providers out there uh, in terms of goods providers look at their distribution and what's been interesting as well and this kind of changes that could change the dynamics for the broader transportation industry is they've realized it's cheaper to actually ship or have direct pickup at an actual retail store than it is at a warehouse which is something that also could be another you know hook for the industry or, or a change for the industry as they start shipping more directly to stores instead of just a warehousing in the distribution centers that is sort of a, the next phase of this as we move towards a more open economy one that we don't worry about contagion quite as much as we did the trailer shortage is partly because of that last mile and so uh, those situations where consumers can pick up goods at uh, department stores or uh, you know out of empty empty malls and other things like that will help the trailer shortage. In addition, uh, I think like most of us, it's difficult for trucks of any real size to get down our streets and deliver the goods. So once again, that that is an issue with the with the uh, with the trailers uh, as well. So uh, I think that that may help uh, in the long run, but it's certainly causing. A significant problem now. Exactly. Unfortunately, none of this is a short-term solution. We've got to work through these bottlenecks. And like you said, late 2021, early 2022 seems like an eternity and the opportunities lost in the interim as we're trying to deal with this. So one of the things we're seeing, Randolph, is that we're seeing the, you know, a large number of industries adapting concepts of a hybrid of work from home. And what we know from that is, and we're looking at it, we're looking at it ourselves. I've been looking into it in terms of what does it mean in terms of productivity. And certainly, you know, knowledge-based employees uh, can work at home. And if they're sitting there doing something like what I do all day, writing or trying to think of um, looking, analyzing the economy, that can be very productive in a home space. But what you do lose, and we know that just being in in the office two days a week can boost productivity growth with people sort of interacting by as much as 25%. We also know that, you know, as we're looking at these work from home hybrids, now it's an accelerant. The work from home trend was a trend that was in place prior to this. It just went to an extreme during the pandemic. But, you know, there is also something lost in translation, especially for young people. This is, there's always been this sort of myth about millennials that they job hop all the time and they're not very loyal. And in fact, they actually did it much less than any other generation of their age group, baby boomers, the X generation, they did it much less than their um, previous cohorts in their age group until now. What we're seeing is because of the detachment and lack of cultural um, and mentoring that we're seeing out there through the work from home, the things that are lost in translation, we're actually seeing many of these people now feel it's easier to be poached and to job hop because they're already working from home and so why not work from somebody else? Their loyalties aren't the same, nor are they getting the same experience and enhancements that they need to grow and, and mature in their own careers. And so this is something that is gonna be a real challenge as we look at 
many firms in the work from home arena and how they embrace it as a hybrid. And I know you've got some insights in the transportation industry and this really feeds into what is gonna be a virtuous or a less virtuous, a more vicious cycle in, turn of in, in terms of innovation and young people within the industry. The number of companies, very, very large trucking companies in the U.S. who are still working from home. All of the executives are still working from home, rarely going into the office, and running two and three, four billion dollar carriage, the largest 20 carriers in the country, let's say. And uh, really fascinating to me that's happened. We were on a, uh, a wrap-up meeting a couple of weeks ago with a carrier in the middle of the country and uh, about a half, half a billion dollar, six hundred million dollar company and the CFO and the tax director were on the call for our wrap-up meeting and the CFO told me that that uh, she said they would never go back to the way it was in the past. That they would never all be in the office together on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and they would be working from home and uh, so that surprised me frankly that uh, they didn't see the end being like it used to be or, or more similar to how it used to be. And um, the other thing that's been fascinating is a very large privately owned carrier, about a $3 billion carrier, family owned uh, on the Eastern Seaboard told me that um, they're not going in as well. And, um, and, and the COO is one of the family members and said that you know, he misses the collaboration that happens sort of by accident while you're you know, walk down the halls with sorts of the so-called water cooler uh, situation, or uh, you know, before and after scheduled meetings. He says when they do conference calls, they address the topic and hang up and don't address any other issues and collaborate and and uh, think of new things. And so, um, both of those things really surprised me. You're right on the uh, on the on the staff. You know, there's been significant turnover at carriers over time. Uh, at the lower levels, not not drivers, but those in the office, and I, and I think you'll see what you just said, where it's much easier for companies to recruit them, recruit them online, going right to them uh, in, in the virtual economy, and uh, so we'll see that as well as, as we'll see it, I think, in professional services firms. We know one of the things, just to add on to that, to sort of button this up, is one of the things many firms forget, and certainly the transportation industry is one that has to be very cognizant of the issue of the impact of their footprint on climate change. And they're dealing with it through, you know, electric vehicles, self-driving vehicles. You know, they certainly have been very supportive of um, different kinds of things out there for climate change, having the government um, invest in infrastructure to make it easier for them to be able to accommodate and do cleaner energy alternatives. But one of the things that gets lost in translation is as many companies start to look at reducing their commercial footprint, they forget about the increased space that's being taken up in residential footprint, which is urban sprawl, which is actually adding to their carbon footprint. And some um, of the major uh, companies out there are now requiring of their service providers them to assess not only their carbon footprint on a commercial real estate basis, but what is it of their people being further away from their main office as well. And I think that's one of the things that gets lost in translation. There was also a really good study done um, by some researchers at Harvard prior to the crisis on work from home that they then translated to the crisis, but they were looking at this trend that was emerging already and how much more space people had to have in order to accommodate work from home. Of course, younger people can't afford as much space to be able to work from home and do these sort of video conferencing and things like that. And the additional cost was prior to the crisis, having to be, comp people had to comp be compensated for their extra re residential real estate as well. And I think, you know, it's easy for executives to sort of us to sit in our bubbles and say, you know, we're in this work from home environment and we can get this done because we have the space and, you know, even with, you know, some bumps in the road, it's not as difficult, but people with young families and younger people that have smaller apartments, um, or if they are now at home with their family, do they want to be able to move back and have that interaction? All of those things play into this larger issue of what does the world look like post-pandemic. We know that it will resemble but not replicate the world we left, but I think we really have to think carefully and I think we're going to have to rethink some things and adjust and be nimble enough to adjust so that we don't lose the productivity, but also some of the other issues that we're going to be judged by in terms of who, who uses us for business. 
Thank you, Diane, for joining me today to discuss uh, economic issues, especially those impacting uh, the transportation economy and uh, companies, not only in the U.S., but throughout the world. Thank you.